as I always normally start off with, it is just a very warm welcome, and I do mean a very warm welcome. And if you're in church at any time, whenever I'm saying something at the start, it's normally down the lines of, I wonder what sort of uh, week you have had, and I wonder what sort of week you have had. Uh, has it been stressful? Maybe with the children being in, and that makes things more stressful, not being able to go to school, or maybe you're stressed because you're not being able to go to work, maybe not having an income coming in at the moment. And there's many things that can stress us out. But the one thing that we have to remember and the one thing we have to be assured of is God is with us and he truly is with us. It's been one of those uh, more difficult weeks with, for some of you, you will know if you're on the Drumcree Parish uh, WhatsApp prayer group, that you will know that James has been in hospital. James is in intensive care and he has been going through a very rough time at this present time. And I know there are people all over the world that is and are upholding him in prayer. James, I've got to know James in a very relatively short space of time, but he has got such a heart. He is such a friend, a colleague, and you know your heart just goes out to him and the prayers certainly it keeps your prayer life very active but also i would ask you to remember patricia as well just patricia is james's wife and corey and the family and it's hard at these times whenever there's uncertainty but the one thing that we can be and should be certain of is that god is with us and god is truly with james and so we do bring James before and continue to bring James before the Lord. You know, over this week, as I've been into the Bible studies and going into different Bible verses and the wee study that I use, it's been interesting what has been coming up over this week. And this was uh, today's Bible reading this morning that I used. And it was from Isaiah 41. And... Uh, from verse 10 and it says so do not fear I am with you do not be dismayed for I am your God I will strengthen you and help you I will uphold you with my righteous right hand you know those are words of comfort they're words of comfort for each and every one of us whatever stress levels we're going through you know I will uphold you with my righteous right hand God's hand is upon us He's not there condemning us. He's there supporting us and encouraging us, protecting us and pouring out his love upon us. And that is for each and every one of us, no matter where we are at, God is with us. So we come today and we come to worship as we do every Sunday. But it is different because we're using recordings at the moment that we have taken from uh, past week's services and with James in the hospital. Uh, well, and with us being restricted and not being able to uh, have the service in church, it's just not possible to uh, do that. And so we're using recordings. So I hope you really feel God's presence in and through all of this. And I hope God speaks to you. Valerie is going to be sharing uh, shortly. And before that, we're just going to go into some worship. So be blessed.
quiet. Lord, just as we come into this time of prayer, we just uh, thank you, Lord. We thank you that uh, you are the constant in our lives and you're the one that remains constant no matter what else goes on. And so, Lord, we can always look to you and know that you're there and know, Lord, that you will uh, stretch out your arms and just throw your arms around us, that you truly do and are the comforter. And we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for all that you continue to do for us, for the blessings that you pour out over us, for all that uh, you give us. And we know that all good things are off you and from you. And so, Lord, we have so much to thank you for. And we truly do have so much to thank you for. We can thank you for our families. We can thank you for our friends. We can thank you for the church. We can thank you for the food that we have. We can thank you for the sunshine, for the air, uh, for the seasons that uh, we we have, Lord. There is so much to thank you for, Lord. There, there's so much, and we should never stop giving you all the praise and all the honour and all the glory and all the thanks. So we just, as your body, Lord, the body of Christ here in this church, as we are gathered together around your word as we're gathered together around the worship and as we're gathered here at this present moment uh, in prayer lord i just pray lord that uh, we would be open that we would be receptive and that we would listen we would hear and listen what it is that you're saying to us this day and with it lord that we are open and guided by you because lord sometimes we can fill our minds are so much rubbish, so many things from this world and of this world. And we need to be on our guard from that. We need to be looking to you. We need to be seeking you. We need to be hearing. We need to be obeying you, Lord. And so help us on this journey because it is a journey and it's a journey that is uh, fraught with much danger. And yet, Lord, with you, we know that uh, what the end part of the journey is, that as long as we remain in you and you in us, that we will be with you in your heavenly kingdom. And that is where we so long to be. That is where we need to be. That is where we have cre been created to be. And so we thank you for that, Lord, that one day we will see you face to face. But until that day, Lord, may you just continue to pour out your love over us and into us. And so, Lord, that we are never working out of uh, being a half empty vessel that we're always overflowing because your spirit is flowing in and flowing out and touching others and so lord we're mindful of those who have been struggling at this present time we're mindful of those who have lost loved ones over this very difficult time for loved ones who have not been able to go into hospital to see their loved ones are not been able to go into nursing homes and how that has compiled uh, their grief, Lord. And so we just ask that you would uh, comfort each and every one that has been struggling through the loss of a loved one. And we particularly think of uh, the family of Billy Grimson as he was uh, led to rest on Thursday. And so we do bring before you Greta, we bring before you uh, William and Denise and Helen and Linda and just the rest of the family, Lord, and just ask that uh, your comfort would continue to be with them as they continue to grieve for the loss of their loved one. And Lord, we know that many are struggling at this present time. We hear in the news about those who uh, have been waiting for operations and not been able to get operations, how operations have been cancelled due to the whole COVID and ones who have had cancer appointments and them being cancelled and that and lord so we just ask lord that you would reassure all those that are just uh, up against it at this present time and so we just bring before you george and we thank you for george we thank you for his family and the support and the love that they show to george and the love that he has for them and in all that he is facing at this present time lord but he is and I know the family are reassured because Lord you are with them and that you will not let them go. So we ask for healing over George. We ask for that 
spirit of healing just to enter into him, to move within him and just to touch the areas within his body that needs to be touched by your Holy Spirit. So, Lord, we just ask for that healing in the precious name of Jesus. For, for Gemma, Lord, and all that she has been facing over the years. And we thank you for her, Lord. We thank you for the strength that she has. And I just pray, Lord, that she would just lean on you and so be strengthened through and by you. And with that, Lord, that uh, she will feel your strength. She will feel your power of your Holy Spirit within her. And she will just welcome it and she will just be touched by your spirit, Lord. And so we commit Gemma to you and we thank you for her, for David, Lord, and uh, for all that he has been facing. And Lord, as he is in hospital at this present time, we just bring him before you, Lord. And it's not an easy place to be at at this present time. And we thank you for the nurses. We thank you for the doctors. We thank you for all those who are involved in the care of David and all those in hospital, whether that is by those who are making the food and preparing the food, whether it is those that are keeping the place clean and safe, uh, those, Lord, who are looking after, specifically looking after David, Lord. We just bring them before you and we thank you for them and we just pray, Lord, for David and for his family, that each and every one of them would know your presence and through knowing your presence would know your comfort. And Lord, as has already been mentioned about James, Lord, I just thank you for James. I thank you for the man of God that he is and for the friend that he is and just for that person that he is and for the, the many lives that he has touched, the many lives that he has blessed because, Lord, you live in him and through you living in him, Lord, you have used him. So he has been a blessing to those around him. And so we just pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would be the blessing upon him and Lord, we just declare healing over this body in the name of Jesus Christ. And we just say, James, receive that healing in Jesus Christ's name. And so we just thank you for James. We thank you for Patricia and for Corey and for the whole family there. And just be with them and give them that peace that passes all understanding as we commit them to you. And Lord, for all those who are unwell, whatever the situation, whatever the circumstance they're facing with, we do commit them to you and we ask, Lord, that uh, your presence would be felt by them, your comfort would be in them, and Lord, also your hand of healing, whatever way that healing comes, Lord, it is of you and so you will heal them. And Lord, for those who are close to the edge of where uh, they are ready for going to be with you, we thank you for that because, Lord, there's no greater thing to know where we are going and to know that you have prepared a place for us. So, Lord, once again, we just acknowledge and give you the thanks and the praise because, Lord, all good things are off you and from you, and we thank you for what you continue to do for each and every one of us. And so we just take a moment of silence for each one of us just to name quietly or to speak it out those whom we are bringing before the Lord, knowing that the Lord will answer our prayer. And Lord, we know that we have put up a lot of requests and we know also, Lord, that uh, our requests will not go unheard. So again, we just want to acknowledge you and thank you for all that you have done. And so we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. And we say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
morning and welcome to this Sunday service from Drumcree Parish. I am just honoured to be here. I'm glad that I have an opportunity to share with you this morning. Um, there has been plenty going on in the past week and we know a lot of folk are, are really battling in the past week and we continue to lift them up as Gary has prayed to the Lord and asked that he would intervene and that his will will be done in all things. This morning we want to look at, if you lift your Bibles, to a passage on the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 3. And we're looking at this, I've entitled this, The Word of the Lord Has Spoken. Um, there's quite a few elements to this and I'm, I'm trying to keep it condensed and people that know me they know that I like to talk. But just to bring a little bit of context to this chapter 3 of 1 Samuel. And we want to want to set the scene for you in that this is one set of uh, double books, First and Second Samuel, that belong to a set of three. So you have First and Second Kings that follow, and then First and Second Chronicles. And these are all these six books are, are books of transition in the Bible. They come from a place of a period of time when there was a, a lack or a, a, a voiceless time with the Lord. The Israelites were having a time and the Bible tells us that they were without the voice of the Lord. Now this title, the word of the Lord has spoken, will give you a bit of clue to the context of where we are going with this. But these books, these six books, are a transitional time that lasted 575 years. And the Israelites are coming into a time when it's the end of the judges and the beginning of the kings of the Israeli nation. And it's about 1100 BC now in 1 Samuel, the first book of these six. And it stretches all the way through the Old Testament, coming into the Babylonian captivity and into the other side. So the Israelites are really on a, a journey of transition, going from the judges of what the God has ordained them to be into a kingship of what they are asking for. And here we have a time and period from chapter three, which I'll read shortly, that will cover exactly how God is beginning to speak in a new way. So we enter this time of history in Israel's uh, as a nation. And we have four main characters in the book of First Samuel. We have Eli, we have Samuel himself, we have Saul and we have David. When coming up to chapter three, we, we see that each one of them have a role and we're really looking at the first two. So we're looking at Eli, the priest at this time, and we're looking at Samuel, who, as we know from reading the Bible, has been birthed of Hannah, this lady who has prayed earnestly for a lengthy time for a son. Now Samuel is the last judge in this period and as I say this this book covers about 40 years in itself and he has been here and he is also called not just a prophet but a seer someone who sees visions so we can name this the word of the Lord has spoken but we can also interpret that as a prophet as Samuel is to be a seer or someone who visualizes what is to come. So the book opens up with Elkanah and Hannah and Hannah as you know is Samuel's mother and Elkanah also has another wife who has bore him plenty of children and she really ridicules and invokes something of bitterness in Hannah as Hannah's only desire is to have a son and this has caused her great pain and and really some bitterness because Penina the other wife has been really bringing some some real ridicule and, and hatred to to Hannah and that she can't she's infertile with Elkanah and of course over time that has got to have a bearing on her heart attitude but Hannah continues to pray and pray she does and you know in the last while we've been thinking about Christmas and coming out of that season I've been thinking about the prayer of Hannah in chapter two. I'll read a little bit of it in a moment, but also the prayer of Mary that we read in Luke one, I think it is. And we know that in the Book of Common Prayer is the Magnificat. And if you look through that, you can see this earnestness of prayer that is rejoicing from the very core of their being, from who they're made to be. There's this 
inner rising of of real praise and worship and honor a realization of who our king actually is this father god in heaven the almighty one who has created all things they have this revelation within them both mary and hannah that raises up a rejoicing a praise a song to god in prayer and luke number chapter one in mary's prayer the magnificat and also in luke chapter or sorry it'll be first samuel chapter two with hannah's prayer if you have time to go and contrast the two of them i'd really encourage you that you do and that you sit and just absorb and take in the lines that they say you can really you can really resonate with their heart when they say the prayer words that they do and these two ladies know what it is to come before God. Mary, I'm sure when she had Gabriel come at the Annunciation, you have a, a time when there's a seed that has been born within Mary, the seed of a redeemer, of someone who's going to change the entire future of mankind forever. And this Gabriel, this angel comes and Poor Mary at 15 year old had not only to contend with this short term of what is she going to do? How's Joseph going to believe her? You know, there's also this long term effect of having to nurture and have a responsibility to bring up this son of man, the son of God to be this redeemer of mankind. Gabriel spoke words that really sowed within her the responsibility of what it is to obey the word of God. And she, in the prayers that you will read in that Luke 1 chapter, you will see just exactly how her heart attitude of accepting the spoken word of God had come to her place of rejoicing, her place of praise. And you know, that seed that was put in her was a seed that, that had so much yet to be done. There's no change could be seen by anyone else. The seed that was put within her from Gabriel, from this annunciation of, of interaction between the two, you could see that a seed has yet to have change and effect in the world, but she knew it was there. There's a time of change in transition when we hear the word of God, that we hear it, we accept it, and we let it have its incubation time. Hannah was no different. And it came at a time when the ridicule, even from the priest at the time, when she was pouring out her confession to the Lord, this bitterness of soul, this longing of wanting a son, a child. And, El and Eli, the priest at the time, had come and, and thought that she was drunk. She was in such a state of despair. This is the purity of her heart that is pouring out, that is crying out to heaven for the answer that she so longed for, that would give her the uh, purpose of living of life. And here she is and Eli turned around and, and says to her, you're a drunken woman, what are you doing? Put away your drunken ways. And I'm sure she was like in despair. You know, no one is coming alongside her in her pain. And when she convinces Eli of her sincerity and the authenticity of her cry, Eli turns round and prays over her, asking the Lord that her request be known and be complete. Hannah believed in that moment, just as Mary did, that that word was true. God has spoken and the word is true. Her whole attitude, and I'm sure her countenance, you can imagine her going home to, to her husband Elkanah and her, he's seeing something so vastly different in his wife that I'm sure he responded with the same atmosphere of praise and not knowing but enjoying how her whole countenance and her attitude had changed. But she knew that she heard from the word of God. Now in this moment, in this time, when everything is still and everything is quiet and the churches are not where they were and your community may not be able to be there where it was before, when things that you have taken for granted, the familiar things of daily routine are not there any longer, what do you perceive in the word of God? Is even your routine and your disciplines with him being challenged in this time, I know I have been challenged in this time of just spending that still moment of having a routine of bringing myself 
to the Almighty God that I know is faithful in all of his word. We'll read on in 1 Samuel in chapter 3, especially when you hear that Samuel hears from God and not one word falls to the ground, the Bible says. Not one word falls to the ground. His word is sure. It's true. Even if you don't see the change that is happening in a transitional time such as this, his word is true. You might not see the fruits of it. You might not see that seed growing in the belly of someone, but you know that it is there. And this is the time when we really dig deep. We shed away of all the things that have been perhaps not completely full hearted and we let them just shed away. And we know that what we are left with when we come through this time, and that might be a very gradual uh, time frame to have when we come through this momentum of going to a new phase of living, a new phase of faith even, a new phase of really belonging to a God who is always faithful and always true. This is a time when we really examine ourselves, when we really dig deep. We see Eli in this story and we know that he is a priest along with Samuel who is under his uh, tutorship. Um, He is a priest who has come before God and is true to God. But he is also a priest that has let himself down in many ways in terms of how he has raised his sons. His sons have gone by the wayside. And when I was rereading this, and I'll read it through now for you in a moment, I was thinking about when I read this, you will see the the elements that had brought Eli and his sons to be where they are. It's really easy to read over scripture, to read a story, read a narrative, continue to read it and grasp the context. But when you break it down, when you sit and contemplate and meditate exactly on each portion of scripture i was thinking about these two sons of eli and how they were they were really quite corrupt the bible says and how sons of a priest who themselves were coming into that line of priesthood could be so corrupt from a man who loved the lord and the bible says that he did not rebuke them when they needed to be rebuked and they took uh, advantage of their office of priesthood And they even had sexual relations with ladies, with women that were coming by at the front of this temple. This is how bad it has got. And even of the sacrifices that people were bringing to them for them to sacrifice as a priest should on behalf of the people, they weren't burning the fat the way they were told through Leviticus. They weren't doing exactly how they should do things uh, in their role. And it's funny that even whenever as a priest you had a a three-pronged fork when the meat was being boiled first you had a three-pronged fork that you would have put through whatever they pulled out that was their their pay if you like that was their taking and they fed from that and the the people were given to them through that elements god had quite specifically ordained exactly what the priest should do But they waited, these two sons, until the roasting part was there, until the smell, can you imagine, even at Christmas when you had your turkey coming out and being set on the table and this wafting of of beautiful meat and you're just, your, your mouth is getting watering and the juices are going. They came at a point in time when they wanted what they wanted, not compliant to what the Bible was teaching them of how to do things. And so this selfish attitude meant that they didn't complete their role as priests. Now that might be, well, they're a bit greedy. They're a bit uh, wanting things for themselves and the way that they wanted them. But even more than that, when I sat to think about this, you have a, a nation of people bringing sacrifices that weren't being atoned for in the correct manner. And over time, this role of priesthood began to really weigh heavy on the people. And they were being... Um, perhaps disenfranchised, perhaps really um, disgruntled with exactly how the priests were treating them and their sacrifices. And it really is a representation of God to the people, but they weren't being represented to God in the way that they should. 
and over time you can you can feel how that bitterness would have gathered speed throughout the people people didn't regard their priests and the sacrifices that they brought the way that they should this to god was something so significant that he cut off the promise of what he had to Eli and his house through priesthood and he gave the priesthood through to another lineage. This is how severe this sin was. It wasn't just a greed of wanting the meat roasted and instead of boiled. There was so much more that they took advantage of and and you can see through this passage just exactly how Eli did not rebuke this way of being a priest the way that he should. It wasn't just the little sins that they had. It was how they were representing God to the people. How the people were getting so disillusioned with who God was because of how their behaviour was. And that to me really struck a chord in that how we represent God to those around us. We are all called to be priests and a royal priesthood at that. Kings and priests. Christ is is the one who is after the order of Melchizedek in a king and a priestly manner. We're all called to be that role. Every one of us representing God to those around you in a manner that befits who he is, not how we just see him to be. Because if we just had that, we have our own mindset, we have our containment of what God looks like in his nature. And we all know that it is so vastly beyond what we could even think or know about who he is. And so we have two priests, two sons here that are misleading the people over time. I'm going to read the passage from chapter 3. 1 Samuel chapter 3 from verse 1. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room and the lamp of God had not yet gone out. Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark was. And then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel. And he said, here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call you. Lie down again. And so he went and lay down. And the Lord again, Samuel, Samuel, got up and went and went into Eli. And he said, here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call you, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. And the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. So the Lord called Samuel again a third time. And he got up and went to Eli and he said, Here I am, for you called me. And then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. And therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And so Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. And then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears it tingle. On that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Therefore I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expiated by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay there until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. He was afraid to tell the vision to Eli, but Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son, here I am, said Samuel. Eli said, what was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. My God also do to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. And so Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And then he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. 
As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all of Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. Blessed be the name, the word of the Lord. You know, this this passage has really spoke to me in a way of a sincerity, not just through Hannah's prayers and not the insincerity of Eli's rebuke to his parental skills or lack thereof. There was something more within this that is the responsibility of every one of us, not just as parents, if you are a parent and bringing up the children in the way that they should go, it's running off the tongue so easy. But I think in the reality of, of who we are as a representative of a priestly uh, a priestly and a, a kingly person to represent God, I think there is a responsibility that we tend to neglect at times. We tend to not think about or be intentional about. But you know, Hannah had prayed so earnestly for such a long time. And I think in the initial stages, probably in her prayer, she she really wanted that Samuel be born, yes, and to her to have a son. But I think there maybe was a sense of, well, I'll show them, I'll have a son and, and I'll shut them up. And, you know, there might have been a part of Hannah throughout that journey of prayer over them years because her her um, adversary, Penina, she had many children. So there was many years of prayers that had gone up from Hannah. And she got to a point and the Lord had not answered her prayer. I wonder of you who are listening here this morning, has God answered your prayer? Are you still waiting on an answer for that prayer? And I wonder how in the, the journey that Hannah had and how the Lord brought her to a place where all of her heart was pouring out, that her commitment was entirely um, without any agenda other than to know that a son, if she would be granted a son, she would give him back. And here we are at a time when it says about how in those days the voice of the Lord was rare and that visions were not widespread. The voice of the Lord was rare. And you can imagine how this people being so disgruntled with how church is, so disgruntled with how things are not the way that they thought they should be, that they they turn to other ways. You know, man is created with an innate capacity to know who and why his purpose in life is. And as we know, that only comes from a satisfaction of knowing who God is, of knowing that as we press in and as we journey, that he will reveal to us that Jeremiah 29 11, that plan and purpose that he has for a, a uniquely every one of us, but also corporately as a body together. In prayers that are not answered, God always has a way of bringing us to our knees, of bringing us to an emptiness, of a desperation nearly, of wanting um, to come alongside, well, Lord, not my will, but yours. And the prayer of Mary when when she answered Gabriel that here I am, you know, I think as well of Isaiah when he he met with that temple, with that presence, that holiness, that awesomeness of God, that here I am, Lord, sent me. These days are are waiting that incubation time, um, that transitional time, that time when we are waiting for an answer of prayer. But to hear the voice and know, to read his word and acknowledge once again that he is in control of everything. Economics, politics, the policing system, the educational system, uh, family dynamics, just no, no matter what is going on in your world. If your prayers are unanswered, press in. Be sincere, more than any prayer that you've ever had. We are praying for so many people in these days, no less James and many others who have been recently bereaved and their families and, you know, prayers are really from the gut, (laughs) from a place within us that that really brings a rawness of our human capacity to feel for others the way that they are um, being felt. I know Hebrews is a 13.3 that we should 
pray like as if we were in prison with our brothers and sisters. This is the the way that the Lord wants us to be, to have a compassion for others, the way that we feel is exactly what they're going through and to walk through that with them, not just click our fingers and realize that we can heal all things and there is a time for that and I believe in that, but also a time to walk with people, to be sincere and then when they suffer, we suffer also. That is what it is to be a part of the body. So for your unanswered prayer, know that God is in the place to answer when the time is right. To know that you will have that answer when it comes completely into alignment with the Lord. That in all things we, we, we stand back and we put our hands in the air and know that he is in control. That he's the one who answers prayer in his time. In this time of transition, I pray that as you listen to this, that you will know that his hand is upon you, that you will rest in that peace and assurance that all things come together for the good of the Lord. And we pray that that you will know that joy and that peace and that comfort of what it is in the word of God alone, that his word is sure, that his word is true. And when he speaks, he will answer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that your word never fails, it never changes, that you are always there. That Lord, that in a time when many things are not where we would have had them to be, Lord, that we could have turned to the left or to the right, but really we're we're forced to sit down, to sit still and to know that you indeed are the Lord. Father, we pray that you will speak to us. That, Lord, that when we hear your voice, just like Hannah, just like Mary, just like Samuel, when he heard and and he's, I hear you, Lord, I come and speak to me. He's, he's entered into a new encounter with you. Father, may we enter into that new time of transition when we encounter you in a deeper way than we've ever known before. Oh, Lord, we thank you for all that you are doing in this time. And we pray that we will submit at every step of the way to your will, to your ways, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
just going to read for us here, and then there's another song. Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him. For he laid the earth's foundations on the seas and built it on the ocean depths. Who may climb the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Only those whose hands and hearts are pure, who do not worship idols, and never tell lies. They will receive the Lord's blessing and have right standing with God, their Saviour. They alone may enter God's presence and worship the God of Israel. Open up ancient gates, open up ancient doors, and let the King of glory enter. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord invincible in battle. Open up ancient gates, open up ancient doors, and let the King of glory enter. Who is the King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory.
just before we say to God the blessing, we say to God the grace, uh, there are many people I could thank. And, you know, for Alan on the whole side of technology and the whole team there, and all of this wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for them. And so we thank you for the many gifts that there is. You know, for me, I just like to thank my wife, Heather. She is so supportive in many different ways. And, you know, to watch her over this last year and with James just teaching her and showing her how to play the guitar and then playing the guitar and singing. And that's not a small feat either that uh, she's been able to do that over this last year. And, you know, I've been talking with James and we're just in the process of setting up a, a wee musical academy in that. And I look forward to that continuing and I look forward to that growing. So to James, I just want to thank James and uh, to the worship group, you know, they have a gifting and they're using that gifting and that is good and we all have a gifting and we all particularly uh, at this time we need to be using the gifts that we have been given and the gifts that we are given is to be a blessing to others so i really do hope that you're using your gifts and if not i would ask the question why not because if it's of god then it is a blessing and if that blessing is to bless others can it be anything better than that, than to be an actual blessing to others? So think about those whom you know and just continue to keep them in your prayer. And think about those people who really mean something to you and bring them before God and really give thanks to God for them because it's important that we actually do do that. And so as we say the grace, we think about those whom we know as as though we're speaking it right over them, as though we're looking right into their face, into their eyes and saying that blessing. So the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Be blessed and have a great week.